This program contains violent content which may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. A wealthy member of the Peace Mission Movement led by Father Divine purchased Woodmont. The property was a 72-acre estate in a wealthy, all-white area of Philadelphia. It included tennis courts, a swimming pool, horse stables, walking paths, and many other amenities. In 1953, after some renovations, Father Divine moved in. Of the many guests Father Divine would receive at his mansion, the most notorious of them all was a man named Jim Jones. Jim Jones was raised in Indiana within a troubled family. His parents rarely made time for him and he struggled to fit in with his peers. He became interested in religion and explored different Christian denominations, but never remained committed to any of them for very long. He would often play church games with his classmates where he would act as the pastor and the other students would pretend to be members of his congregation. He also formed an interest in political philosophies. He read about Karl Marx, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Adolf Hitler, and Mahatma Gandhi. His feelings of exclusion led him to empathize with outcasts in society. He later reported that his hometown was so racist that he didn't even see a black person until he was 12 years old. He slowly began to feel that his community's racial views were horribly wrong. After high school, he met a nursing student named Marceline Baldwin, whom he later married. In 1951, he and his family attended a few meetings led by the Communist Party USA. Jones was intrigued by their ideas, but was hesitant about the Communist Party's atheism. He decided it would be easier for him to work within the church to spread a message of social and racial justice in order to reach those who would be opposed to communism on religious grounds. In 1952, he found work as a student pastor in a Methodist church. However, he immediately had disagreements with church leadership over their practice of racial segregation. Jones claimed that he was fired and began receiving death threats when he invited black people to attend the church. The church leaders, however, claimed that Jones had been caught misappropriating funds. In any case, he decided to create his own church, which he eventually named People's Temple. The new church began with only 20 members. The theology of the People's Temple included elements of Jim Jones's past experimentation with various political and religious movements. There was an emphasis on racial integration and social justice. He included gospel music and also a culturally African-American preaching style. To attract new members, he started holding so-called faith healing events. In 1956, Jim Jones sought out Father Divine. He had heard rumors that the leader was teaching blasphemy and manipulating his members, but Jim Jones, who was also maligned and mistreated for his ministry, wanted to learn about the peace mission movement himself. Any honest inquirer can verify from the United States Treasury Department that Mr. Devine has never received any personal remuneration or paid one dime income tax. He nor any official in the organization individually have their name on one piece of property. The followers pool their resources and buy all properties cooperatively or as a non-profit corporation to further humanitarian programs that MJ Divine propagates. He exercises a greater faith in people than many full gospel pastors because he maintains no legal hold on the members or the property of his group. Jones was impressed by the integrated communal living arrangements of the Peace Mission's followers. When he stayed in the Peace Mission's hotels, he experienced their quality service at low prices. He was convinced that this was cooperative communalism in practice. He noted the way that Father Divine's followers pooled their resources and jointly owned properties in order to successfully accomplish the organization's goals. He also marveled at the reverence and obedience Peace Mission members showed their leader. He wanted to know how Father Divine convinced his members to be so fully dedicated to his ministry. I wanted to make it for a long time. Most of mankind has shared your hope. I'm very impressed with such a beautiful place. It's heaven. Father, you were forced to leave New York. Was it because you were too weak to conquer the Philistines? No, my son. It was because we were becoming too strong and they were frightened. But how could you sustain such a movement? 
and how did my son Moses sustain his flock? But the cost, ask, and you shall receive, my son. Ask, and you shall receive. All worldly possessions, sustenance of whatever kind the Holy Father requires. Father, um, sometimes the women in my flock tempt me. What shall I do about that? It is your duty, your religious obligation to um, bring their desires to the surface so that you can eliminate them. Remember, Mary wasn't a virgin. I think you've given a whole new world to me, Father Divine. As it should be, so let it be, my son. Tell me. Do you really believe that you are God? I don't have to say that I am God, and I don't have to say that I am not God. I say that thousands of people call me God, millions of them, and millions of people call me the devil. But I don't say that I am God, and I don't say that I am the devil. But I produce God and shake the earth with it. Thank you, Father. While we do not know exactly what may have been said in private conversations between Jim Jones and Father Divine, Historians have noted the many changes Jim Jones made to his movement after 1959. The most notable change was that suddenly Jones instructed his followers to call him and his wife father and mother. He and his wife adopted a child of Native American ancestry and two Korean children. In 1961, they would become the first white couple in Indianapolis to adopt a black child. After having a biological son, the couple referred to themselves and their children as a rainbow family, further displaying their commitment to racial integration. In 1962, Jones came to believe that nuclear war was imminent. He went to Brazil, a place he had read would be safe from the disaster, to explore building a self-sufficient community there. He returned to the U.S. in 1963 when loyal members alerted him that the church was on the verge of collapse. Upon arriving back in the U.S., Jones announced that a nuclear disaster would occur on July 15, 1967. He moved his church to Ukiah, a northern California city near Redwood Valley, and told his followers that they should begin living communally. Members were required to donate 25% of their wages and told it would be distributed to meet everyone's needs. Liberals in town were impressed with Jones, whose lifestyle seemed to indicate a genuine commitment to social change. Conservatives, however, were suspicious, worried that the interracial anti-war church was an offshoot of the leftist hippie movement. Jones put conservatives at ease when he organized a fundraiser for the families of police officers who had been killed or injured on duty. The leaders of the community responded by making him president of the grand jury of Mendocino County. Jones was careful to conceal his communist sympathies in public settings, but to his members he taught a self-constructed theology called apostolic socialism. He slowly began criticizing mainstream Christianity. Borrowing terminology from the peace mission, Jones called the God of Christianity a sky god. He told his followers that the Bible was a tool used to oppress women and non-white people. The temple's alleged enemies changed over time. First, it was the Ku Klux Klan. Soon it became the U.S. government. A leadership structure in the People's Temple emerged. At the top of the hierarchy was a group called the Inner Staff, which reported directly to Jim Jones. These individuals spied on members of the church and kept files of their findings. Below them was another group called the Planning Commission, which was comprised of about 100 people. This group helped Jones plant fake defectors amongst the congregation in order to identify people who were thinking of leaving. They coordinated fake confessions, during which members were forced to admit wrongdoings that they did not commit. Jones used divide-and-conquer techniques and told members of these groups false things about other members to ensure they all remained suspicious of each other. The church membership grew as Jim Jones ingratiated himself with California politicians and recruited people from other churches through his faith-healing events. Former members would report that animal parts like chicken livers were used to convince people that Jones was removing diseases from their body. By 1970, People's Temple membership was about 7,500, and the church's newspaper, People's Forum, had a circulation in the tens of thousands. 
The church moved to San Francisco, where they repeated the same process which had worked for them in Ukiah. Jones was so successful winning over politicians that he was eventually appointed to the president of the San Francisco Housing Authority Commission. In 1971, Mother Divine received a visit from an old friend. Father Divine had died six years earlier, and she was now the head of the Peace Mission Movement. Jim Jones and several hundred of his followers unexpectedly arrived at the Woodmont Estate. Mother Divine offered to give Jim Jones a tour of the residence, and the pair went to the mausoleum where Father Divine's body was buried. During their private conversation, Jim Jones allegedly offered to take control of the Peace Mission Movement, but Mother Divine refused. Later in the evening, during an infamous Peace Mission Holy Communion banquet, some of Jim Jones' followers stood up to testify about how he had changed their lives. Jones stood up after his members testified and declared that Father Divine's spirit had entered his body. He was aware that Peace Mission members had been taught that the spirit of the first Mother Divine, Paninia, had entered the body of the second Mother Divine, Edna Rose Richards. Jim Jones was attempting to use the same doctrine for himself. Mother Divine immediately jumped into action. She declared that Jim Jones was not a friend at all and was really the other fellow, a term the peace mission used to describe the devil. She ordered him and his followers to leave and forbade them from entering any of their properties again. Letters arrived at peace mission establishments inviting members to attend People's Temple events and even promising free transportation via charter buses. In a letter responding to one member who left the peace mission to join the People's Temple, Mother Divine wrote that it was ridiculous to believe that Father Divine would come back as a human being again since the world was so close to ending. Due to the peace mission's teachings that Father Divine was present with or without a physical body, few wavered from their devotion simply because he had died. Jim Jones was angry that he had been unable to lure away a large number of Peace Mission members. He told his followers that Mother Divine had made sexual advances towards him while they were alone and was retaliating against him because he had refused her requests. In 1972, yet another attempt was made to convert Peace Mission members to the People's Temple, but only a few members left Mother Divine and joined Jim Jones. keeps recurring to me, and at this moment I feel very strongly. Uh, last year when we were in Philadelphia and we saw the adulation which had been lavished on leaders who didn't deserve it, one of the my companions, a uh, young woman in the uh, temple, said to me, I'm so glad that our prophet hasn't taken that trip. And I said, if he had taken it, I wouldn't be on it. Now, I hope that you mean, you know what I mean. Uh, some of us, and I think most of us, love him because of the things that he will do for us on the human level and the fact that he doesn't let us give him diamond rings and cars nor accept our worship. I just felt moved to say that we do appreciate he isn't there. <laughs> That's how much. <laughs> well, I took the same trip last summer, and in a way, I think the people back there had something over us. They listened and when something was said, when those tapes were played, and I thought... Father Divine was a horrible speaker. I thought he was boring. I thought he didn't have anything to say. Out of all due respect for you children, and I respect you because you're here, and anything that brought you here, fine. But I, I listened, and it was boring to death. But those people sat, and they even watched that tape recorder or whatever it was that it was coming from. And when someone who represented the office of that time came, Mother, which I think, well, I think we all share her thoughts of her, they watched her, and they listened to her. When people, when they would stand out there for an hour waiting for her to come out just to watch her, and she wasn't anything to look at. We can't even be quiet. We can't stop from talking to our neighbor. We can't stop from reading a newspaper. We can't stop from writing an address book. We have to go into the bathroom. We have to have somebody walking up and down the aisle. I'm not saying it's the older people, but, you know, bringing us drinks of water. I don't know. 
I, in a way, I almost wish that he had been that way, because maybe then we'd listen. And what think I know, I'm not saying I would be, but I'm saying the respect that I saw there for nothing, we're not getting for everything. And I think we had a lot to learn about the respect that went on back there that we haven't got here. And I, for one, didn't keep it. So I'm as guilty as anybody else. People's Temple members began to attack Mother Divine's leadership by calling her a racist white mistress who was living lavishly off of black labor. Interestingly, the People's Temple membership demographics were similar to that of the Peace Mission movement. Though the membership was majority black, its leadership was majority white. Matters came to a head in 1973, and that year Jones was arrested for soliciting gay sex in Los Angeles. Despite the church's teachings about sexual abstinence, this event came as no surprise to former members who had gone public with accusations of abuse. They claimed that Jones was abusing drugs with the help of doctors who were members and wrote him illegal prescriptions. In 1975, the prophesied date of nuclear fallout came and went without incident. Jones's mounting legal troubles, scandals, and fear of more defections prompted him to search again for a place to start a commune. He eventually chose Guyana, a country in South America. The country was chosen because English is its official language. It has a large black population, and in Jones's opinion, the country was ruled by a socialist government at the time. In December of 1973, with the help of Guyanese officials, Jones selected a remote tract of land 140 miles from Guyana's capital of Georgetown. The government of Guyana allowed the church to rent 5,000 acres of land for $300 US dollars a year. The rental included an option to expand land usage by another 27,000 acres in the future. At the time, the annual revenue of the People's Temple was $600,000 US dollars per year. In November of 1974, a small group of 50 members were sent to establish a self-sufficient community on the land. Initially, the effort seemed successful. Back in the United States, however, another legal battle was unfolding for Jim Jones. Two former attorneys for the People's Temple, married couple Grace and Timothy Stone, defected and formed a concerned citizens group to highlight abuses within the church. During their time as followers, the Stones had listed Jim Jones as the biological father of their son, John, and had allowed him to be sent to live in Guyana. After the couple left, they recanted their claims about John's paternity and demanded that he be returned. Jim Jones refused. In the summer of 1977, the church advertised the People's Temple Agricultural Project, which was later renamed Jonestown. Members were shown images of Jim Jones kneeling among large tropical fruits in a supposed paradise. 1,000 people donated their possessions to the church and moved to Jonestown, believing that they would help establish a socialist community. The rapid increase in population at Jonestown destabilized its tentative self-sufficiency. Housing was inadequate and food was scarce. Improper nutrition led to disease, which Jonestown doctors struggled to identify and treat. Residents were forced to work 12 hours a day to meet the community's needs. To maintain control, Jones swiftly replaced all religious rhetoric with so-called socialist teachings. Complaints or doubts were punished with head shavings, public humiliation, and shunning. Some were sent to The Box, a six foot by four foot underground enclosure. Many were forced to stay there for weeks at a time. Vini Thompson, I, Thompson, I don't want to do this kind of bullshit. First night she was hostile and said she didn't do anything to get on. In the morning she said that man, Pastor Jones, said I only had to stay one night. She said that man, Pastor Jones, said I only had to stay one night. She said that all the people who reported Garnett to Council in LA were liars, nasty, bad attitude. Talks back continuously, says she has arthritis, aches, and is cold, can't do this or that. Elsa Bell got mad and yelled at her. She called Dad Pastor Jones again today, complained throughout the whole day. Why don't you get your damn nasty ass together? Well, Father, you know, <clears throat> you know I apologize with you, but that, you know, not too long ago. And I've tried, I've tried my best to not to say it, to say it, Father. 
And uh, and we had a meeting. You said, Vini, you can say it. You can say it, Pastor Jones. You remember the day we had a meeting here at the church? But no, still, we had a law that just reversed all that. Nobody still, called me Pastor but, Jones. No, no, you haven't been listening, Vini. That's a long time back. We said it was all, everybody said it was dad or our father. There was no in-betweens. But they were having, when the man gonna come I don't him. give a shit what was said back there. Since then, we've changed the rules. They changed the rules. That's got nothing to do with this, all this bullshit behavior. It's hard to say. I am not. You said all the people that reported Garnett were liars. No wonder Garnett has trouble. Nasty attitude you kept. You. So we. Oh, shit. I don't want to answer this kind of shit, and I know what the answer is. Put him in a bed with a frog. I think this is just bullshit that you pulling. You need to do what you told, and I told you last night to do what you told, and keep your mouth shut. Uh, you're not gonna get off the crew. So I, I think she, I think she should be sent to the box. Residents were forced to repay damages or losses back to Jonestown. Since money was banned, these repayments often took the form of food deprivation. Jones was inspired by Father Divine to record his speeches. Jonestown was outfitted with loudspeakers, which broadcasted these recordings for hours on end every day. In his rants, Jones castigated the Stones, who he claimed were involved in a fascist conspiracy with the U.S. government to destroy a so-called socialist community. During these broadcasts, no one was allowed to talk. Armed guards patrolled the settlement, ostensibly to defend against outside threats. However, many believed the real purpose for the guards was to prevent people from leaving. Jones warned that every defection would only be used as ammunition against Jonestown. He continued a ritual, which had begun on a smaller scale in the United States, called White Nights. Members were awakened in the middle of the night and forced to listen to rants about the alleged threats to Jonestown. Jones co-opted a concept pioneered by Black Panther Huey Newton called revolutionary suicide. He claimed that defectors would be tortured in the United States and forced to turn on the movement. He prophesied that an attack on Jonestown would occur and everyone would be killed by the United States. According to Jones, the only way to avoid a painful death and avoid becoming a traitor to socialism was to take their own lives. They were given a red liquid and told it was poisonous. Next, they were ordered to drink it and everyone complied. White nights occurred several times without any real deaths occurring. The residents were so fatigued and scared that many of them failed to question the purpose of these drills. In June of 1978, a Jonestown resident named Deborah Layton was able to escape and return to California. There, she wrote an affidavit about her experiences, which eventually made it into the hands of U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan. In Layton's affidavit, she reported that the land had failed to produce crops and the community was forced to import all of its food. She believed that the residents were being intentionally starved. On a typical day, they ate rice for breakfast, rice water soup for lunch, and rice and beans for dinner. On Sunday, they were given an egg and a cookie. The elderly were sometimes given eggs throughout the week. Jim Jones, meanwhile, ate meat, vegetables, and other rich foods. Those in his inner circle were also allowed to eat better meals and tended to have better health. Congressman Ryan was known as a flamboyant but committed fact finder. Elected in 1972 as representative of California's 11th district, Ryan would go to great lengths to learn the truth. In one case, he lived with a black family and worked as a substitute teacher in a local school to learn about the conditions which led to the Watts riot. In another situation, he spent 10 days as an inmate in Folsom Prison to assess the need for prison reform. The concerned citizens group led by the Stones begged Congressman Ryan to investigate the status of their loved ones in Jonestown, who they were unable to make contact with. Congressman Ryan arrived in Guyana on November 15, 1978, with a small team of journalists and concerned family members of Jonestown residents. After days of negotiations, the team was allowed to visit the community and were greeted with enthusiastic testimonies, stating that residents were happy and did not want to leave. When the investigative group returned the next day, however, several members passed notes to them requesting help. 
In total, 15 people announced that they wanted to return to the United States. The congressman and his team attempted to leave with the defectors quickly. Suddenly, a member attacked Congressman Ryan with a knife, but he was able to fend off the worst of the attack. After the congressman left, members were instructed to prepare a mixture of flavor aid and cyanide. Jonestown had been importing half a pound of cyanide monthly since 1976. Jim Jones had received a permit for the shipments under the guise of using it to clean gold jewelry. There's evidence that he authorized testing of the flavor aid cyanide mixture on pigs when he was told that they had a similar metabolism to humans. When the congressman and his team arrived at the airstrip, they were ambushed by a fake defector within their group named Larry Layton, a relative of defector Deborah Layton. Larry opened fire, killing Congressman Ryan, NBC reporter Don Harris, NBC cameraman Bob Brown, San Francisco examiner photographer Greg Robinson, and Temple member Patricia Parks. Others in the group ran into the jungle to escape. After the shooting, Jim Jones was told that not all of Congressman Ryan's group had been killed in the attack. Jones ordered everyone to the pavilion. So my opinion is that we be kind to children and be kind to seniors and take the portion like they used to take in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. And not take our death in vain, you know. Yes, Christine. Is it too late for Russia? Here's why it's too late for Russia. They killed. They started to kill. That's why it makes it too late for Russia. I think that there were too few who left for 1,200 people to give them their lives for those people that left. Do you know how many left? Ooh, 20 odd. That's, that's a small... 20 odd. Come, come, 20 come odd. Compared, compared to what's here. 20 odd. But what's going to happen when they don't leave? I hope that they could leave, but what's going to happen when they, don't, when they don't leave? I said I'm afraid to die. I don't think no you means. are. I don't think you are. But uh, I look at our babies and I think they deserve I, to live. I agree. You know? They des- but also they deserve. What's more, they deserve peace. We all came here for peace. And know? we've have we had it? No. I tried to give it to you. I've laid down my life practically. I've practically died every day to give you peace. And you still not had any peace. You look better than I've seen you in a long while, but it's still not the kind of peace that I wanted to give you. The vat, the vat. Where's the vat? With the green C in? Go on around to the sky. The and thank you, Dad. The vat with the green C in, please. Bring it here so the adults can begin. Beg you, don't, don't fail to follow my advice. You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry. That we do it and that they do it. We didn't commit suicide. We committed an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. A brave member named Christine Miller can be heard on the recording suggesting alternatives to suicide. She asked about a previously proposed plan to move to the Soviet Union. Jones rejects this suggestion, claiming that the Soviet Union would not accept them since people had been shot and killed at the airstrip. Christine attempts to argue that while she is ready to die, she believes the children should have a chance to live. This argument is also rejected. Jones claims that living in peace is more important than living. Eventually, members of the audience berate Miller for attempting to argue against death. At one point, Jim Jones states that no one there can live without him. He ordered the children to come forward first, and members gave them the poison. Afterwards, adults came forward to drink. Members who were away from the compound at the time of the mass murder were called and told to exact revenge on the temple's enemies before committing so-called revolutionary suicide. Marceline Jones resisted initially when the children were killed, but went on to drink poison herself. Jim Jones shot himself in the head. 87 people survived the Jonestown Massacre. The Jonestown basketball team, which included Jones's three sons, was traveling for an away game and survived. 
One woman hid in a dormitory and slept through the tragedy. Another man hid in a ditch. Others hid in the jungle. An autopsy of Jim Jones's body showed levels of barbiturate pentobarbital that would have killed an average man of his size. His addiction had become so severe that he had built up a tolerance to the drug. Of the dozen or so former Peace Mission members who joined the People's Temple, all of them died in the Jonestown Massacre. In response to the tragedy, Mother Divine issued a statement through the Peace Mission's official newspaper called New Day. After detailing Jones's attempts to take over the Peace Mission movement, Mother Divine concludes by stating her beliefs about why Jonestown ended in disaster. Now, at 47, Jim Jones is dead, the man who so desperately wanted to be God, in whom good was no longer to be found. Had he sincerely desired to bring himself into subjection to the life of Christ as he saw it demonstrated in Father Divine, he could have led a fruitful career. But because he mocked God by self-aggrandizement, his greed for power, the lust of the flesh, the love of money, his anti-American spirit and mind led him to destroy himself and all those who followed him also. Truly is the scripture fulfilled. For the leaders of the people cause them to err and they that are led of them are destroyed. Isaiah 9:16. There are many explanations for why some of the People's Temple members argued for their own deaths that fateful day. First, they had been purposely deprived of sleep and food for months in order to make them easier to control. Secondly, there is still speculation about whether or not they believed that final white night was just a drill like all the others. Thirdly, many were elderly, had given up their possessions and left their families to move to Jonestown. Isolated, scared, and suffering, they may have been deeply depressed and easily convinced that there was nothing left to live for. Of course, all of these explanations still implicate Jim Jones, the person who put all of the deadly conditions in place. Mother Divine was no doubt self-assured at the demise of the People's Temple. The Peace Mission had often used tragic world events to reinforce their belief that the only true manifestation of God was Father Divine, and those that opposed him would suffer consequences. In reality, the Peace Mission and People's Temple were very similar. Both were majority black female religious movements. Both had charismatic leaders at the helm who manipulated the horrible racial discrimination of their times to lure people into their sphere of control. The biggest difference between the two movements was how they stole people's lives. In the days leading up to the massacre, Jim Jones was increasingly obsessed with leaving a political legacy and being perceived as a socialist hero. He wrongly believed that the deaths at Jonestown would become an inspiration to socialists around the world. Father Divine, meanwhile, was only concerned about his outside reputation during his years of active recruitment. By the 1950s, he lived comfortably from the support of devoted followers who figuratively gave their lives in service to his theology. In other cases, he abused people physically and financially for years before discarding them when they questioned his teachings. Sadly, we know this can happen again. Because many of society's problems seem so insurmountable, people continue to look for God on earth. I still think, as an individual, I have a right to... You do, and I'm listening. ...what I think, what I feel, and I think we all have a right to our own destiny as individuals. Right. And I think I right. have a right to choose mine, and everybody else has a right to choose theirs.